Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are. Uh, my name is Baden Prince, and welcome back to the World Storytelling Cafe, a wonderful initiative set up by Mr. John Rowe in collaboration with various other good folk, and featuring a host of fantastic storytellers from all over the UK and indeed all over the world. Uh, there were storytellers from America, there were storytellers from Colombia, there were storytellers from Morocco. Um, and over the course of the last couple of weeks or so, um, we've been treated to some wonderful, wonderful storytelling from some absolutely amazing storytellers, including some of my favorite tellers and some of my favorite people. Um, at the moment, the World Storytelling Cafe is featuring storytellers from the Americas and the Caribbean. I, as you may have guessed, am from the Caribbean. I'm from the island of Antigua. And today I'm going to be telling you a couple of Caribbean tales. And if you enjoy what you hear, and indeed if you enjoy what you hear from any of the storytellers on the World Storytelling Cafe website, that's worldstorytellingcafe.com, um, down below the storyteller you will see a virtual hat in which you can leave a tip, um, give generously. Um, some of us are dependent on what we do for a living and um, rest assured your money will not be wasted on sensible stuff. It'll go on good, good things. I think you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, um, welcome, and I'm going to tell you my first story. This is the story of Cedric and Dulcie. It's an adult story, both in the sense that it's a story about two adults, and it's also a story aimed at adults. Cedric and Dulcie. This was always set back in the days when men were men and women knew their place. The bad old days, as we like to call them. And Cedric comes home one day to find his whole house in pitch darkness, pitch black. Not a light anywhere, so dark. He couldn't see his hand in front of his face. Of course, I don't understand why, because that's how his hand looked. Not like that, like that. So I don't understand why he couldn't see it. Anyway, that's besides the point. Whole house in pitch darkness. Not a light, not a glimmer of light anywhere. Cedric called out to his wife, Do see? What the hell going on here? Dulcie come out, all of a flap and a flutter. Cedric, Cedric, you 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 can't see the 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 the, the bulb the bulb blow and 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 and, and the, 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 the the fuse break and 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 the socket the socket burn out and 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 no electricity come in the house and the whole place dark and Cedric Cedric do something now Cedric pull himself up to his full height of around five foot six and with all the sarcasm that he could muster, he said, Hmm, is what I look like a electrician? Dulcie just shake her head and let off one long chops. But she didn't say a single word. Next day, Cedric come home. Hmm. The whole house flood out. Water everywhere. It's as if it's as if the river Ganges, the river Nile, and the Mississippi decide to get together and have a prayer meeting in Cedric House. Cedric walk in. He go. 
Dulce! What the hell going on in here? Dulce come out. All of a <laughs> of a fafana flutter, well, more like a splash and a splutter, to tell you the truth. And she say, Cedric, Cedric, look, you, 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 you can't see the, the, the tap, the tap burst and, 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 and the pipe break and, and the cistern overflow and the, 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 the sink run over and, and, and the, the toilet flowing over and, man, Cedric is, is just water everywhere in the house. Cedric, Cedric, man, do something now. Cedric pull himself up and this time he looked like he was more like five foot seven. And with every bit of sack as he could muster, he say, Woman is what I look like to you. A plumber. Dulce shake she head and she roll she eye. But she never said a single word. She just let off one long piece of... <clears throat> Next day, listen, I'll tell you all something, you know. You see, Cedric, this guy unlucky, you know. In fact, back home, we wouldn't say he unlucky. We would say he bad lucky. And when you have as much bad luck as him, you would say, boy... He bad luck it bad. <laughs> or he bad luck it for true. Man Cedric so bad luck it when he come home the third day. <laughs> Every single window catch. Every latch and every door. Every aperture, every entrance, every exit, every single one break. The window and them flapping backwards and forwards in the wind like the pages of an open book. His front door clapping, bang and forth like, you know, the cymbal player in a marching band. Bash! Bash a tower! Bash! A bash a tower! <laughs> Cedric step inside the house. Hear him. <laughs> Do see! <laughs> Poor Dulce Jack. <laughs> she name must be wear out by now. Dulce! What the hell going on inside here? Dulce come. And she teeth chattering because the whole house open and exposed to the element. She can barely talk. She she shivering. She cold. She it's a, see 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 you 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 can't see the the, the window latch br break and the, the 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 door the door key broke open and the, the everywhere wide open and the four winds coming in and all, all the elements and and the whole house insecure. Cedric man, Cedric. Do, do do something now. Cedric pull himself up to his full height of five foot eight and he say, with all the sarcasm he could muster, woman, what I look like to you, a carpenter? Do say why she, she shakes her head. She rolls she eye and she heave a deep sigh. But she never say a single word. She just let off but as she famous. Well, the next day, finally, much to Cedric relief, and I dare say to yours, Cedric come home. And and the, the house, the house snug, secure, warm, light up like a Christmas tree. Cedric walk in. Dulce! He find Dulce sitting down in the kitchen, at the kitchen table, looking very pleased with herself. He said, Dul D D D Dulce, what happened? What, what? And Dulce, Dulce said, well, Cedric... I tell you what happened. I get so tired of all the drama. 
you know, the, the, the house flood out like three rivers meet. The door and the window, them wide open. Anybody could come in here and do anything. And no light. The place pitch black. So I decide to go to town. Since you say you're not doing nothing, I go to town. And I walk around and I walk around and eventually I find a man. And the man asked me what wrong. He see I look upset and so on. I explained to him and he say he can come and he can fix everything. So he come back with a toolbox. And boy, the first thing he pull out is a screwdriver. I never see a screwdriver big so. With a big hell of a tip. And you know what he do? He go round and every socket and every switch and all the fuse box and all the bulb and them, man, he take out that screwdriver and he, 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 he twist it and he turn it and he, he work it. And when he done, all the light come on and working. But before that, the first thing he did do, he reach in the toolbox and man, Cedric, he take out a big piece of hose and never see a man with a piece of hose long so. And he used the hose and he did suck up all the water and he dry out the whole house. He dry out the house from the top and he dry it all the way down to the basement. When he done, the house dry, the house warm, the house clean. And then like I tell you, he take out the screwdriver and he fix all the electricity and he never finished there, you know. He go back in the toolbox and he take out a hammer. And Cedric, in all my barn days, me never see a man with a hammer big so. The hammer have a big head and it heavy, you see. And he take the hammer and he put it to every door, every window, every opening and every aperture. He ram it with the hammer, he bash it with the hammer, he lick it with the hammer, he thump it with the hammer. And when he done, every window locked down tight, all the door them lock up tight, the whole house nice and tight and warm and secure and everything everywhere nice and cozy. <laughs> Cedric sitting down there and all this innuendo and double entendre gone clean over his head, you know. Because all he's thinking is the place fix, everything nice, but you see, Cedric is a man. Cedric very, how you say this? He very careful when it comes to money. He's a man, he don't spend a bad penny. So all the time he looking and he thinking. So he says, so tell me, do see how uh, uh, all of this good work the man do? Um, how how much is? Uh, and when he when he nervous, and anything to do with money make him nervous. When he nervous, he start to stutter. He says, so 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 all this all this work this man do. How 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 much you? How, how, how much you going to go, 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 charge? How much you going to charge, 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 charge? She says, Cedric, let me just put that into the drama one time and tell you what happened. When the man finished do the work and he come to me and I ask him, well, how much to, 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 to fix all of this? And when he tell me how much he looking to charge me, I said to him, but we ain't have that kind of money. So the man said, well, is one of two things I could do to satisfy the bill. Is either I could take him in the bedroom and I lie down on the bed with he and I make some sweet love to he and we can satisfy the bill that way. Or he said, I can go into the kitchen and I can get out some flour and sugar and egg and I can do some mix up, mix up and I can bake some nice sweet meats, some nice sweet treats for him. Hmm. Boy, Cedric start to sweat. 
and his heart started to beat so fast he thought he was going to drop down dead. But then he remember. Do you remember? When he came in the house, remember he found Dulce sitting in the kitchen, by the kitchen table. <laughs> Boy. Whew, Cedric, that was a close one. So he says, so Dulce, tell me now. What you make for the guy? What what you do? You 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 bake some banana bread. What you bake? Uh, some some bulla cake. Some some short bread. Some some sweet biscuit. Is what what what, what you bake? Give him. <laughs> Do she look at him and she say, <laughs> Cedric, is what I look like a baker? <laughs> Welcome back to the World Storytelling Cafe. I'm Baden Prince. And um, I'm telling you some Caribbean tales today. And if you like what you've heard so far, remember to look down at the bottom of the picture and just underneath you'll see the virtual hat. And um, please feel free to drop an offering into the hat. It'll be most welcome and most uh, uh, generously received, as generously received as I hope it'll be generously given. Now this next story that I'm going to tell, my second and final story, has quite an interesting, um, quite an interesting provenance. It's one of those um, devil stories, and by the way, I'm indebted to Mr. Dave Tong for some fantastic tellings that I've heard him do recently. Um, absolutely love them. This particular story, I've heard Dave do a version of, but I stumbled across it in a book um, of tales, a book of court tales, um, collected and edited and put together by the lovely Kate Corkery, with whom I had the pleasure of sharing a stage. I've had the pleasure of sharing a stage with her on a number of occasions. Wonderful storyteller, lovely person. And um, Kate very generously gave me a copy of the Cork Tales, and as I was reading through them, I came across this particular one, which is the story of the wife who tricked the devil. And I've subsequently come across various versions, including Dave's, um, and I'm sure there are many others out there. Now, what's intriguing about the tale that I'm about to tell you is that... I like this tale so much, I was working on memorizing it. And I got into a conversation with a friend of mine, um, Ngoma Bishop. Um, he runs the writers group that I'm a part of, the African Heritage Writers. And I mentioned this story to Ngoma and gave him a brief synopsis of the story of the wife who tricked the devil. It's a really interesting illustration of what happens to stories as they pass from teller to teller and from place to place and from person to person. And Goma said, that reminds me of, and proceeded to tell me a totally different story. The story that the one I'm about to tell you is actually based on, which I've subsequently also adopted and adapted and turned it into the tale of the man who tricked the devil. And I've made it into a Caribbean tale because it has a couple of elements that, as you'll see, um, are very particular to certain aspects of Caribbean life and Caribbean culture. So here you have a story which started life as, as far as I was aware, an Irish folk tale about a clever wife who tricked the devil to save her husband. It turns out that there are myriad tales based on a similar premise um, of clever wives who outsmart the devil. But the idea behind that suggested to somebody else a totally different kind of story, which they then discussed with me, which I liked so much that I took and ran with it. And it's now become this story, which is the story of the man who tricked the devil. I've set it in the Caribbean, in my home island of Antigua. And the first thing to, <laughs> to let you know about this story, it's that it's rooted in the rivalry 
between the various territories of the Caribbean. We're terrible for it. I mean, here in Britain, you've got, you know, the Scots and the Irish and the Scots versus the English and the English versus the Irish and the Irish versus the English and the Welsh versus the English and the English versus... In fact, it's kind of everybody versus the English when, when you really get down to it. But there's this rivalry and there's this sort of intense, sort of almost like sibling rivalry on some levels between the different territories and between people from the different territories and one another. And so it is in the Caribbean, many, many times intensified. And so it is that on this particular day, down on the beach in Antigua, one afternoon, minding my own business, just trying to catch a nice cool sea breeze and relax. There were these three fishermen, and these three fishermen are doing what fishermen do when they're not out at sea and when they're not peddling their goods, i.e. they're caulking their boats and fixing their nets and tacking their sails and mending their oars or whatever else it is they do. And the conversation between the three of them invariably, because they're all from different parts of the Caribbean, gets round to the question of which island or which territory is the best in the Caribbean. Never-ending topic of conversation. So there's a Jamaican. <laughs> of course there's a Jamaican. There's always a Jamaican. No matter where you go, you can't avoid them. They're everywhere. <laughs> they're like... <laughs> They're like, what's going on at the moment? You spend all your time trying to avoid them, but if you're lucky, you'll manage it. But um, yes, Jamaicans are everywhere, believe me. So there's a Jamaican, there's a Guyanese, and there's a Barbadian, or a Bajan, as they like to be known. And the Jamaican starts off, they always start off. If there's ever any argument going on anywhere, you can guarantee it was started by a Jamaican. Safe bet, trust me. Jamaican says, Jamaica's the best place, not just the best place in the Caribbean, it's the best place in the world, to the world. This is how they talk. Everything is to the world. And when pressed to back up his claim that Jamaica's the best, he starts citing, and to be fair on him, he had a fair amount of evidence to back him up. He cited the fact that Jamaica has given the world not one, not two, not three. I caught my finger in case you're wondering. Not four, not five, but actually six separate genres of music. Because back in the old days, there was mentor. And then mentor led on to Blue Beat and Blue Beat led to Rocksteady and Rocksteady led to Ska and Ska led to Reggae and to what we nowadays have which is called Dancehall which is really a development on from Reggae which takes myriad forms and that's actually quite an achievement if you think about it for one small territory to have generated all these different forms of music all of which have got worldwide appeal so Jamaican was holding forth and he was talking about all the stars from the Rocksteady era and the, the Ska era, the Scatterlights and whoever else and the early Blue Beat period and the great studios, Cox and Dodd, Scene One and so on and all the great producers and all the great artists. And then, of course, in the 70s, as we know, when reggae went worldwide and international and Bob Marley became Jamaica's first truly international super, well, megastar. But before him, you had the likes of Jimmy Cliff. You had Toots and the Matals. And behind them, you've had Third World. And, you know, and he's going on and on and on, as Jamaicans do. So everybody's sitting there thinking, yeah, we have to give him his due. Yeah, we give you that. We give you that. And then he says, not satisfied with owning the world of music. Then he says, we pitch way above our weight when it comes to sports. And then he starts talking about the great legacy of Jamaican sprinting that started way back in when Adam was in short pants with whoever the man was. And then the people, them that did the bobsleigh thing. And then he started going on about, of course, 
the great Usain Bolt and all that nonsense and you know the greatest superstar in modern athletics whose achievements will never be met measured let alone better than oh god and he went on and you and in the end he finished finally at which point the Guyanese jumped into the argument well Guyanese people if you don't know any and I understand there's a fantastic storyteller who will soon be featured here in the World Storytelling Cafe who goes by the name of Toop a wonderful artist I've heard so much about this man over many many years and I'm really looking forward to seeing him well as far as I know he's Guyanese and if I have the opportunity to or if you have the opportunity to talk to him when he comes on ask him if what I'm about to tell you isn't true which is that when it comes to pride in your country <laughs> Jamaicans are bad but Guyanese whoo different level one time I remember turning up at my uncle's house he was having a christening party for his daughter who'd just been born and this is no word of a lie this is a true story and this is not a storyteller's true story this actually happened so when I say it's a true story because I'm a storyteller I can see you out there going yeah yeah, yeah baby yeah sure uh -huh. yeah we'll, no serious this is not a storyteller's true story this is actually a true story this happened I walked in my uncle's house in Hackney and literally I pushed the door and there was a man standing right there never see this man before in my life don't know him from Adam a man looked me up and down and he said you come from Guyana and I said no he said Guyana the best place in the world Guyana the best place on earth and he actually stepped forward into my face as he said it as if daring me to shake my head and disagree with him I took a step back I mean this is my uncle's house I'm I'm just here to turn up to have a lime and a drink and a good time and eat some cake and some food you know I don't I didn't come here to fight nobody man was in my face literally like daring me to disagree that Guyana is the best place in the world and luckily my uncle's girlfriend stepped up behind him waved at me reached out and grabbed my arm and pulled me round the guy and into the party leaving him standing there glaring at me like you know like a wild animal that had been deprived of its meal i said oh, well boy this guy and his people i'm sure Toop's not like that by the way but me and him will have words about this when i get the chance so anyway the guy and his man steps up and he says to the jamaican you know, it's all well and good you boasting about Jamaica this and Jamaica nice and Jamaica the other and Jamaica the next. But when you get right down to it, he says, Jamaica is still an island. You're just one of many small islands in that long chain of islands called the West Indies. We, however, we Guyanese, we are part, and this is true, we are part of the South American continent. We are part of a much larger land mass. So no matter how much you all do this and think you're great at that, at the end of the day, you're just a bigger one of many small islands. We are part of a continent. That means we're bigger than you. And that means we're better than you. See, he obviously hadn't got hold of the mantra that size doesn't matter. So they tell me. I wouldn't know. Anyway, moving on from that nonsense. The Guyanese man having made his point, or thinking he'd made his point. The Bajan step into the argument now. What can I tell you about Bajans? That won't land me in trouble with all my Bajan friends. And possibly land me in jail for libel or slander is it slander okay I won't tell you anything about what I know about Bajans but I will tell you this Bajan people they're proud like punch they're proud of their long history and their association with Britain proud I tell you no Englishman born and bred 
can be as proud of the fact that he's an Englishman as Barbadians are proud of the fact that their country has this close association with Britain. In fact, and this is true, if you didn't know it before, you heard it here today and remember it well. Barbadians will tell you that Barbados is actually one of the counties of England and that Barbados' real name is Bimshire. That's right. They call it Bim for short. Bim short for Bimshire. A representation of the fact that Barbados is part of England and part and a proud part of the glorious British Empire. Serious. So the Bajans' point to both the Jamaican and the Guyanese was that Jamaica was an island, however big it was, it was only an island. Guyana might be part of a continent, but that's still just one country. Barbados, he's saying, was part not only of the so-called Commonwealth, which we all are in the West Indies, but crucially, Barbados was part of an empire. That's how Bajans talk, empire. And boy, that set the cat among the pigeons. Ah, oh, the argument that's the all oh, the argument that went on. Now remember, we're in Antigua. Antigua's a small island, 12 miles by 908 square miles. Pretty. Well, Antigua, prettier than the prettiest woman you ever set eyes on in your life. Prettier than Justine Demir, may I tell you. Pretty so. Prettier than Hannah. Prettier than all of them. Anyway, I'm there on the beach in Antigua, trying to just chill out, catch a breeze, relax. And these three idiots making up this big argument that going on and on and this one better than that one, better than the other, and which island we are, and Gary Sobers are the greatest cricketer ever and there, and Dwight Yard play football from there, and blah, 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 and on and on and on. Till I get fed up with them. Truly, I just got fed up with the ignorance. Couldn't take it anymore. So I walk over to, and furthermore, not, none of them come from Antigua. So why, why are they giving me aggravation in my own island? on my own beach. Vex it on. I walk up to them and say, hey, I'll tell her something. You see all this big chat you all going on with and all this nonsense argument and who better than who and who bigger than bad and who biggest, baddest, whatever. None of what you all saying make any sense because everybody knows, every fool knows, even the trio you should know and the trio you're very foolish. The only man that matters the only man that can stand up and say that he is truly better than all other men is the man who can fool the devil. Now tell me, between the three of you here and me, who you think is the only one who can fool the devil? Well, in my vexation and my anger and my fed upness, I actually forgot the golden rule which is they say when it comes to the devil, if you say his name, he will surely appear. I didn't mean to say his name, you know, I meant to use some euphemism, you know, but I was vexed, I was angry man. So I said, the devil name, and jeez, um, who tell me to do that? No sooner was the words out of my mouth, the whole sky went dark. Pitch black couldn't see a thing. Then there was a rumble of thunder and a flash of forked lightning that like just struck the sand almost right between where we were standing. Missed us by maybe just a couple of feet. Frightened. And between the dark sky and the rumbling thunder and the lightning flash, there was this horrible, horrible stench this awful sulfurous odor that just got up your nose and choked your throat and we're all gagging and coughing and ah and then as quickly as it happened the clouds cleared the sky was blue again the sun came out 
and there standing in our midst was none other than the prince of darkness himself well you never see four grown men frightened so <clears throat> and before any of us could even stop and think what to say or what to do he spoke in a deep sonorous voice very sinister very threatening he said so it sounded something like that deeper even deeper but that's as deep as i can go so he is there one amongst you that think that he can fool me that he can trick me well i tell you what i'll do i'll give each and every one of you in turn the chance to try and the one who succeeds I will give him wealth beyond his wildest dreams I will give you a house on the highest hill in the island of your choice if if you want to live in a big house in the Caribbean and impress people you have to live on a house up on top the hill where you get a nice cool breeze at night time and the breeze will blow where the mosquitoes mosquitoes won't bother you so if you see a house built halfway up a hill that guy's half rich but the guy with the house at the top that's the top dog so the devil promised big house on top of the highest hill he promised wealth he promised jewelry gold silver rubies diamonds pearls emeralds he promised money in the bank he promised cars he promised all your heart's desire highest and lowest basest and most honorable well we're men we're only men somebody's dangling all that good stuff in front of you what do you think you're gonna say so like fools we all said yes and everybody decided that we're gonna give it a go and see who could fool the devil well Jamaican straight in there I told you wherever there's a Jamaican and there always is a Jamaican they're first in and the Jamaican he jumped in his boat he grabbed the oars and he rowed out rowed all the way out way out to the deepest part of the sea to that part where the sky and the sea meet at the horizon where the one disappears and seems to become the other where they say the ocean is at its unfathomable deepest that means it's so deep there is no measuring how deep it is and how far down it goes and when he got there he looked around carefully from left to right or from right to left whichever and Jamaicans have an expression I don't know where they get it from but they will say just stick a pin when they want to prove a point so a Jamaican will always have a safety pin somewhere around his clothing as if to say if you and them are in an argument and they want to push you that bit further they'll produce this pin and offer it to you and say just stick a pin as in if you think you're bad take that pin and dig me and see what will happen so out of nowhere he produced this pin and looking around left right left again making sure nobody could possibly see he surreptitiously leaned his hand over the side of the boat and released that tiny sliver of silver into the water it twinkled briefly in the sunlight and then disappeared down 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 into the depths where it vanished hopefully he thought never to be seen again and satisfied with his endeavors he turned and he rowed back to shore pulled his boat up onto the sand put the oars inside and walked back over to where the rest of us were standing waiting for him including the devil who waited till he got right up close to him and then said this that you have lost I have found 
and I'll now return it to you. And he shook the man with his own pin, made him jump about 10 feet in, and he said, yes, that's right. You failed to trick me. And now I'm going to take your soul. And with that, he reached in, wrenched out his heart, ripped it out, and took it down, 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 down. Consigned the man's soul to the very depths of hell. It was all over in an instant. Now, any sensible person at that point would have turned and ran, yeah? But we were so bedazzled by this promise of wealth. Man thinking nothing about the acres of land that they're going to own and the gallons of rum that's going to be in their cellar and the, the, the parties they're going to have and the women they're going to have round and the amount of carousing and big eating and big fat they're going to have. We were all stupid with desire. So the Guyanese went next. Now, Guyanese have a thing for gold. I don't know what it is. I don't know if they have gold in Guyana. I don't think we have gold anywhere in the West Indies, but maybe they have gold in Guyana. Maybe that's their obsession with it. But they love that thing about gold. And any Guyanese, any true Guyanese worth his salt, y'all can check with Toop when he comes on here soon. They'll have some piece of gold somewhere about them, even no matter how tiny it is. A Guyanese got into his boat and he did the same thing the Jamaican did. He rowed all the way out to sea, all the way out to where the sky meets the sea at the horizon, the point where the water is at its deepest. And when there, he produced from wherever he had it hidden, a tiny fleck of gold. I don't know if it was maybe like the pin at the back of an earring or something that had broken off a piece of jewelry, maybe a bit of the clasp of a chain or whatever. But this tiny piece of gold, barely discernible to the naked eye, and he dropped his hand, he dropped his hand over the side of the boat into the water. And he let this tiny speck of gold fall off and down into the depths of the sea. It twinkled briefly before it disappeared way down into the dark and then satisfied with himself he turned and he rowed back to land pulled the boat up onto the shore tucked the oars inside and came swaggering over to where the rest of us including the devil was waiting for him the devil waited till he was right up close and personal and then he went this he said rolling that tiny bit of gold between his fingers. This that you think that you had lost, I have found, and I now give back to you. And now I'm going to take your soul. And he reached into his chest, ripped out his heart, taking his life force and his soul with him and took him down, down into the very depths of hell where he was consigned to remain forever. That just left me and the beige, huh? Now, I don't know why I didn't run, but I guess I thought maybe the beige huh, was going to nail it, and then I wouldn't have to do anything. The beige huh, walked over to his boat, boat as hell, you know, climb in, started rowing. Now, what we didn't see was on the way, he just dipped his finger down and picked up a single speck of sand which stuck to his little finger as he rowed his boat out, out to where the sea and the sky met at the point of the horizon. And when he got there, he surreptitiously flicked that one speck of sand off his finger into the water, where it disappeared down into the, into the depths. And he thought, yes, I've done it. He came back to land pulled up his boat, chucked the oars in, and came bouncing over to where the rest of us stood waiting. Me and the devil were waiting for him. And as he got up to him, the devil said, this you think you have lost. 
I have found and I give back to you. <sighs> and he blew the same speck of sand off his finger into his face. And he blew the same speck of sand off his finger into his face. And then he reached into his chest, ripped out his heart, took his life force, his soul with him, and took it down, down to the very depths of hell, consigning him to remain there forever. Well, that just left me. Frightened, you see? I thought, how did I get myself into this? Me and these three idiots, I should have left them alone with their stupid argument. Now look, what's going to happen here? <sighs> Boy, anyway, I usually carry a little, um, a little hip flask with me, right? And the hip flask has a, has a top that you unscrew. And when you turn it over, it turns into a, a little shot glass, like a small thimble. It doesn't hold very much. And suddenly I had an idea. So I turned to the devil and I said, none of these guys was able to outsmart you, you know, but you see, you're dealing with an Antigua now. You're dealing with a Garrett. I've got your mark. And the devil said, you really think you can outsmart me? <laughs> Which was kind of unnecessary because if you're the devil, you're the baddest dude on the planet. You don't need to do a pantomime villain laugh. I really didn't see the point of that, to be honest. And I, I thought, I thought he demeaned himself slightly by doing that. But I weren't going to tell him that. The devil him near me, you know. <laughs> you think I'm going to criticize the devil? You are right. You stay there. What I did do is I walked down to the sea as if I was going to go in and swim out. And when he was looking, I dipped down with the little cap and came up with a tiny cup full of seawater. And then I turned around and walked back up to him. I waited right at the edge of the shore, just where the water came in. And I said, come here. He started walking over towards me. I said, so if I lose something, you guarantee you're gonna find it and bring it back to me, yeah? He said, yeah. I said, all right, find this. And I turned the cup upside down poured the water back into the ocean. I said, right, go find that cup full of water and bring it back to me now. Stopped him dead in his tracks. That's right. You're looking at the man who tricked the devil. But hear the joke. I know what you're thinking, you know. You're saying to yourself, but Baden, why aren't you living on a big house on a hill somewhere back in the Caribbean? Where's your... Where's your gold and your jewelry? Where's, where's your millions of dollars in the bank? Where's your, your Rolls Royce or your Bentley or your Ferrari or whatever? Where are these wild parties? How come you don't invite us round to your house? How come you're not flying us out to the Caribbean on your private plane? How come you're not hosting the world storytelling cafe in Antigua in your, your big house on the hill? Huh? What are you doing here with us poor folk? Scraping a living and struggling like everybody else. Well, the answer is quite simple, you know. In case you never knew, remember the date and time when you heard this. The reason I'm not endowed with wealth, a big house, a car, money, and all those things that I was promised is because the devil... I'm trying to look you straight in the eye and I can't figure out where on this camera the, light, the eye is. I'm looking that way. The devil is not to be trusted. Thank you very much for listening. That's been my second presentation for the World Storytelling Cafe. And if you've enjoyed my Caribbean stories, and if you've enjoyed indeed... The stories from all the other tellers, and there have been some wonderful tellings by some wonderful tellers. It really has been a feast, a feast of storytelling, a feast for the eyes and the ears. Um, 
please feel free to put a little offering into my virtual hat below or indeed into the hats of any of the tellers. Spread the word, encourage people to go to worldstorytellingcafe.com and to visit the story circle and they will find an array of some of the finest storytellers to be found anywhere. Please explore, enjoy, and whatever you're doing and wherever you are, stay healthy, stay safe, stay indoors. We'll get through this together. Thank you very much for listening. Did you enjoy that storyteller? Of course you did. And if you enjoyed it, like the minstrels of old, we're passing around the hat. And if you have some, whether it's paper, or coin. Our storytellers would appreciate what you put in. Every penny you put in goes directly to that storyteller through paper. All you have to do is go to worldstorytellingcafe.com Click on today's stories or click on that storyteller and there'll be a hat below the story. And you can just drop a little in that hat. Well, thank you for listening. And if you can afford it, we'd appreciate it.